completed the brochure with the itinerary and all of that information on the website. There's been a slight modification, an adjustment of prices in a downward direction. So if you're going on that trip or interested in going on that trip, then uh, check that out. Also, if you have signed up and are going on the DC trip, we have some additional information uh, that has come to me from Museum of the Bible. Finally, they're, you know, they're making it up as they go along, okay? So some of the information they gave me in the summer wasn't, when they, when they, by the time they opened, it had changed two or three times, and now that they've seen how things go with groups, they've changed again. So none of that affects us a whole lot, in fact, uh, but that information will be going out. So be sure to watch your email and also watch the website for that information. <clears throat> How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, as usual, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer. The reason we do this is so that you can be spiritually prepared to study the word, to fellowship around the teaching of the word, so that we are walking by the Spirit. When we sin, we're no longer walking by the Spirit or walking according to the Spirit. We're walking according to the flesh or the sin nature. The way to recover is to confess sin, and then we're forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness, and that includes restoration of that fellowship with God, enjoying that ongoing relationship with Him. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for so much for the way in which you work in our lives, for the way you bring us to an understanding of your word, challenge us in application of your word. Father, your word is alive and powerful, and it is through your word that we are transformed, first through the living word in the gospel, second through the written word and the way in which we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, this time we also want to remember the Broussard family as uh, they lost uh, their son-in-law, Bob, this week, or last night, actually, early this morning, and we pray for them as they go through this time that you would uh, be a real comfort, and this would be also an opportunity to be a real testimony to your grace. Our Father, we continue to pray for us that we might be a testimony, both individually and as a church and congregation, uh, with our focus upon you and upon your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, tonight we are going to do a flyover. I said this last week, flyover of 2 Samuel. Even though we started 2 Samuel, as I have looked at 2 Samuel, I am of the conviction that we must organize and outline First and 2 Samuel together, since in the original it was one book. It was divided this way because of its length and because of the length of a scroll, as I pointed out last time. And actually, the best place to make the break is at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 1, when David has heard the news that Saul has died, and it is at the beginning of chapter 2 that he becomes the king, not over all of the 12 tribes, but only un over the two tribes in the south, Benjamin and Judah, and he will reign for seven and a half years from Hebron before he, uh, the tribes are united under him, and then he will uh, reign approximately 33 years after that. So that is the story of 2 Samuel. The focus is upon David, and I have titled this message, David, a man after God's own heart. This is a description of him from the scripture, uh, 
And it teaches us that even though we may fail miserably, even though we may sin sins that shock and grieve us and uh, cause great harm to others, God's grace is sufficient to forgive us and to restore things, and there, there's no sin that is too great for the grace of God. And God's assessment of David is that he was a man after his heart and that his, God's assessment of, of Saul was that Saul was a rebel and that he had re, uh, rebelled against God and committed sins of idolatry and, and witchcraft. And yet when you look at Saul's sins, they are not social sins that most people think are more egregious more horrible than the sins of David. And so David is a picture of picture of God's uh, of, of God's grace. So as we come to look at 2 Samuel, there are three basic divisions in the 24 chapters of 2 Samuel. The first division is that God blesses David and God unites and expands the kingdom. Sometimes this is just shortened to David's triumphs. But as I pointed out last time, I like to make God the hero. God's the, the, the actor. He is the one who is uh, overriding history. And so God blesses David. We see the ascendancy of David, the unification of the tribes, and then the expansion of the kingdom under David. And then in the next section, which covers 2 Samuel 11 to 20, this is where we see David's great sins in chapters 11 and 12. We see the consequences of those sins in 13 through 19, and then we see God's restoration of David. There is something of a typology there for the history of Israel. Because David is chosen by God, he's anointed by God, he goes through a period of time when he is uh, chased in the wilderness, as it were, as Israel was in the wilderness, and then he is a time, there's a time of great blessing and prosperity in the land, and then David is chased out of Jerusalem by his son during a time of, of, uh, of the time of Absalom's revolt, much as Israel is removed from the land uh, in 722 and then later in 586. But because of God's covenant with Israel, because of God's covenant with David, there is no loss of relationship with God. The covenant, covenants do not end. And God restores David to Jerusalem and to his kingdom just as he will eventually restore Israel to the land and fulfill those promises in the Abrahamic covenant. So we have the triumph and then the tragedies or we have God's blessing on David as the kingdom uh, is united and expands and then God disciplines David for his sins. David reaps the consequences but God in his grace turns or transforms cursing into blessing. And then the last four chapters comprise six distinct episodes that are not given in chronological order. These are events that occurred during the time of David, uh, during the life of David, and each of them gives evidence of the greatness and the significance of God's covenant with David. So that gives you the overview of 2 Samuel. Now, if you look at a lot of commentaries and a lot of and study Bibles, and I have my Ryrie study Bible up here, and so I looked at the opening outline, and for his outline, he has seven major headings. Some people will have four. I like just three. It keeps it simple. You can remember it. You can remember God's blessing of David, God's discipline on David, and then uh, the six episodes. It's, it breaks down very, very simply, and I think that... Um, that keeping it simple helps people to think through these books. So then we can take this outline, the outline from 1 Samuel, and put those together. And there we have 
basically three divisions based on the biography, Samuel, Saul, and, and David. And then we have uh, the two broad divisions here in 2 Samuel. So that allows you to just think through the book when you're, when you're reading it and doing different things. And uh, I encourage you, we're coming up on the beginning of a new year and the challenge to read through your Bible again in a year is to think of different ways that you can uh, highlight, mark up your Bible. Uh, years ago, I don't know if they even make these anymore. I bought three or four and a lot of <clears throat> a lot of uh, uh, of the uh, colored lead for it was this six color pen, and you can change the color. And I would sit there and I I color different words. I have sort of my own what it means to me, and I can highlight a word. And so if I go through a chapter and you see a word used over and over, you know, highlight them all the same color so that you can notice that, that there's this, this word that's repeated over and over again, things like that. And don't be afraid to write in your Bible or mark in your Bible. I have a friend who's a member of the church who uh, has given me one of her older Bibles, and I have to take out my magnifying glass to be able to read the printed text on the page because on most of the pages so much has been written there you can't even read what the original scripture says. So um, there are many people who have Bibles like that. I've never had a Bible last long enough for me to get it that marked up. So anyway, that's the basic breakdown. So we'll start in the first section. The first uh, 10 chapters, I should change that on this slide, uh, 2 Samuel 2 through 10. 2 Samuel 2 through 10, we're going to start in the first part of it. Uh, this is the beginning of David's, um, David's kingdom. And I can already see that as I was going through this, I got interrupted a few times this afternoon, but in this first uh, first section, we have the beginning of David's uh, kingdom. And he moves, so in the first section, just the first uh, three plus verses, David's move to Hebron. And that's what we read here. It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up uh, to any of the cities of Judah? Notice he's asking about going up to Judah. He doesn't mention Israel. He's he recognizes that the northern tribes are all have this loyalty to Benjamin. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. His power base, as it were, is in uh, Judah. And so God gives him direction to go to Hebron. Now, what's important about Hebron? A couple of things. Hebron is the burial place of the patriarchs. You can go there today. In fact, I hope to go there on the next trip to Israel. Never taken a group down to Hebron, down to um, Judah. Uh, that area is available and um, it's not, hasn't been a problem. Part of, uh, t it's interesting, they've taken the tomb of the patriarchs, they've divided it so that um, Abraham and Jacob are under Israeli control and their wives. We have Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Leah. But Isaac and Rebekah, that tomb, is under Palestinian control. So you can't just go in on one side of the building and then walk around and go in on the other side of the building. You have to get in your car and you have to drive about 20 miles to go all the way around and go through a border crossing and go into Area C and then come in on the other side and that's on the Palestinian on the Palestinian side. But that's where the Tomb of the Patriarchs is. So that would have been true. Now the building that's built there now is built by Herod the Great, but that would have been true for, at David's time. This was where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. Hebron is also important to the narrative of this story because it was the city that was given to Caleb, and so this is the major city in, in Judah's territory. But it is also a city of refuge. And as a city of refuge, this is where someone guilty of manslaughter can flee. And so the, um, the family of the person killed is, is not supposed to seek 
revenge upon them and take their life if they have taken refuge in Hebron. Just set that aside until we get to about chapter 3 or 4, then that will make a <clears throat> that will make a distinction. So David moves to Hebron and then as what we see here is example of his graciousness, his goodness to his enemies and his goodness to those who have honored Saul. In the previous chapter, we saw that there was an Amalekite who claimed that he had taken the life of Saul, but he had not. And nevertheless, David did not know that. He took him at his word and had him executed for taking the life of the Lord's anointed. So what we see here is David is still honoring the law, honoring uh, Saul uh, because of the office that he held. And so the men of Jabesh Gilead were the men who went to um, Bethshan. They took uh, Saul's body down from the wall and they took him back to Jabesh Gilead and buried him there. We'll see that that later within Second Samuel, uh, David will go and he will exhume the bones of Saul and Jonathan and bring them back to be buried at the family tomb in, uh, in Gibeon. So we see that in the next few verses, and then we see the beginnings of a problem. I thought I'd fix that. The beginnings of a problem under 3C, and that is Ish-bosheth's coronation over Israel. Ish-bosheth is a surviving son of, of, uh, uh, of Saul, and Abner, who is Saul's uncle, but is also was Saul's general, he's the one who's going to be the power broker and making this play. He goes to Ishbosheth to make him the king over the northern tribes, and he will reign for for two years. And this sets up a conflict between Abner and Joab that takes up much of the rest of this chapter. Now, I don't know how many of you all have ever seen The Godfather, either Godfather 1 or Godfather 2. And at the end of both of those films, the Godfather takes out his vengeance upon just a host of family enemies. And it's uh, dramatic, it's uh, visually uh, fascinating the way... Um, Coppola has put that together on the screen, and you just see one scene after another, and then it shifts to this backdrop where uh, Michael Corleone is bap, bap, becoming godfather to his, his, uh, his nephew. And so there's a lot going on in this, this whole, whole scene. And that's what you see here, is you just see this vengeance, this, this taking of life and this battles between the tribes in Israel where they're on the verge of just absolutely imploding and annihilating each other. And that's what's described here, and we'll be going through those chapters in the coming weeks. But Israel and Judah are fighting together, and you, it's centered around uh Abner, who was Saul's general, and Joab, who is uh, David's general. And we learn of, of, <clears throat> of um, uh, uh, Joab's uh, two brothers and their mother, Zariah, who they are, we, when we look at that, we learn that they are actually related. They are uh, cousins to David. And you have these these uh, three brothers. You have uh, Joab and uh, Azahel and Abishai. And Azahel is chasing uh, Abner, and Abner is going to kill him. And this sets up a huge revenge motif that takes place over the next couple of chapters. And the thing that I want to point out is that as David is as gracious to his enemies... We don't see any hint of a spiritual spark in the sons of Zariah, in Abishai and uh, Joab and um, Isahel. There doesn't seem to be any spiritual interest, and they're just caught up in this web of, of vindictiveness and taking revenge and out on their uh, their enemies from the camp of Saul. 
And so this continues as a backdrop in these initial chapters. And we have to answer the question, what is going on here? Why are we told about this? And I think it's to help us understand that Israel's not perfect, that you still have profound carnality going on in the, in the nation. Uh, we ought not to elevate or idolize I Israel as always having it together because they really don't. And the carnality is just, is just rampant through this section. But we learn also that because of David's obedience to God, that he is a man uh, after God's own heart, that God blesses him. And so there's this list of his uh, six sons in chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. And this is to emphasize David's um, prosperity, that God is prospering him, God is blessing him. And this is all under the aspects of the, of the Mosaic law. So that takes us up through about verse Five of chapter 3, and then we see a slight shift that takes place uh, starting in 3.5 going th through 5.16, and this is when God begins to work to unify the kingdom. It becomes clear to Abner that Ishbosheth just isn't the man to carry the uh, reign of Saul, and so he, re Abner rejects Ishbosheth, becomes very angry with him, and then uh, goes to sell his services to David. He wants to be the kingmaker. He is a power broker. So he goes and he is going to offer the northern tribes uh, to David. And what happens in the process of this in 2 Samuel uh, and the last part of 2 Samuel chapter 3 is that as, um, as Abner has come into Hebron, when he is leaving from his meeting with David, then Joab is going to take vengeance on him and kill him in the city limits of Hebron. Now, what's wrong with that? What's going on here? Hebron's supposed to be our city of refuge. This should not take place. This shows something about Joab's character. Later on, David, David says, why, why am I stuck with these sons of Zariah? Uh, and because they are just all about themselves and their own power base. So we just see how within the politics of that era, as with any era, it's, it's people are just out for their own power and accumulating uh, the own, their own wealth. As a result of all of this in chapter 5, uh, we learn that Ishbosheth is murdered in 2 Samuel chapter 4. And again, much like the situation with the murder of Saul by the Amalekite, there are these two brothers who murder, uh, murder Ishbosheth. There's Rechav, uh, or Baana, and Rechav, who are the sons of Rimon, and they are the ones who assassinate Ishbosheth. And then they go and tell David, thinking that that will curry favor with David. And David, of course, is not at all impressed by that. He still has his loyalty to the uh, house of Saul. And that's another thing that we see coming through again and again is David's loyalty to God, his loyalty to the law, his loyalty to Saul, even though Saul's family sought to kill him. And his loyalty uh, to Jonathan is going to come out as well. And then at, in chapter 5, we see the unification of the 12 tribes, the unification of Israel with Judah, and David now becomes the king over all uh, all of Israel. And we're told in chapter 5, verse 5, in Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years in six months, and in Judah he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. And that would mean that, that he is uh, basically out um, for about 10 years. He reigns for 40 years, and the total of um, uh, 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 subtracting that and doing the math, that means that he was probably pursued by Saul for about 10 years because he was around 18, 19 to 20, at, uh, just probably just under the age of service in the army, about 18, when he uh, fought Goliath. 
So then we come to the fourth section here in 3.6 to 5.16, where God again lists additional children that are uh, born to David in, in Jerusalem. And so this again emphasizes how God is blessing David and how God is, is providing for David. And all of this is designed to help us understand some things about uh, God's plan and purpose for, uh, for David. So in all of this section, let me just summarize it under about uh, five points. During this time, we see uh, the foreshadowing of problems with Joab. This is going to continue to plague David and his administration uh, throughout his life. Joab's a realist. He has very little spiritual interest, and he's constantly working to manipulate things. But because he's family, David is stuck with him. And this, this is a problem, and eventually he will have to deal with it. Uh, these chapters set the stage for the later political turmoil and the civil war that takes place when Absalom, David's son, will rebel against him. But one of the things we see here is that David constantly seeks the Lord in prayer in these first five chapters. Whenever there's a decision, David goes to the Lord in prayer, and that is part of his spiritual greatness. He is growing and maturing spiritually, and he is dependent upon the Lord for those important life uh, decisions. Again, um, also David treated his enemies with grace, and he treated Saul and his family with grace, and he remains loyal to that covenant that he made uh, with with Jonathan. And because David is concerned about God's honor and God's glory, we see God blessing him, making him prosperous and and fruitful. So this takes us through this this first part through five through the middle of chapter five. And the last thing that we see before 516 is David's conquest of Jerusalem, the city of the Jebusites, that becomes known as the city of David in chapter 5, verse 7. And when we get there, we'll see the maps that uh, we have of the city of David. And it's not very big. I, it always surprises folks when we go to Israel the first time and we stand up on the Mount of Olives and we look across the Kidron Valley and we point out that, that little narrow finger of a, of a ridge there that was the old city of David. And it's, it's like all of that happened, that's just really small. It's small, but it's not insignificant. Because remember, this is still a rural area. It's not an urban uh, culture. And so people are out in their farms and their vineyards, and that is where they are doing the work. And they're just, you don't need to have a large urban, uh, urban environment. And so in these sections of 3.6, are actually from 2.1 to 5.16, the other thing that we see here is God providing political unification for David and an emphasis on that, that political unity. Now there's a shift that occurs starting in the uh, midpoint there of chapter, chapter 6, or excuse me, chapter 5, verse 17. We see the last part of his victories over the Philistines where he uh, defeats them in 2 Samuel 5, 17 to 25, and he drives the Philistines out of the land of Israel. And so he's fulfilling that responsibility of an anointed king. What is a king supposed to do? Biblically speaking, today we think government has all kinds of things they're supposed to do, that they're supposed to provide welfare, and they're supposed to provide education, and they're supposed to provide uh, for jobs and all of these other things, but that's not the biblical understanding of, of what God intended government for. Government is to protect people from internal enemies, from criminals, and from external enemies, which means to defeat those uh, political enemies for Israel, that would be the Philistines and the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Syrians, all of these will be defeated by David in the coming chapters. And so we see God 
continuing to solidify David's political gains. But at this time, he, David is also focused on spiritual realities. He's focused on bringing God to a place where there can be a permanent sanctuary, a permanent temple. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we will study about the movements of the ark again and how David brings the ark into Jerusalem, but he doesn't do it according to the law of, of Moses. And because of that, when the uh, mule that is bringing the cart in stumbles, hits a bump, and the cart jostles, uh, Uzzah puts out his hand to steady and stabilize God, and he is instantly killed. Now, David has great respect for the law, and his, he, he stops everything, builds an altar, but David doesn't move the ark again because I think he is upset with himself. He is uh, upset with what has happened, and, and he, he wants to wait. He has great a fear of the Lord there in a positive sense. We also see the situation with uh, Michelle, Michal, who is Saul's daughter and who is taken from him, married to another, and she ridicules David for his dancing before the Lord. And so she, she looks at him uh, with a great deal of disrespect. We're told also at this time that David uh, <clears throat> built an altar, altar burnt, burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord, and he made... Uh, he distributed food to the people, and this is a sign of his prosperity and how God is blessing him. It is done graciously. It is not done because the government has mandated it. It is done because you have an individual who is worshiping the Lord within the framework of his royal position, and he freely seeks to uh, give to others from that which God has provided for him and blessed him. It is after that that Michelle, Michelle Michel, uh, ridicules him, and as a result, she will be cursed and be childless. And there's a contrast in com there between the prosperity and blessing and fecundity of David and the uh, lack of children, lack of blessing on Michal and her family. And this culminates in what begins to be the center of 2 Samuel. There's a center that goes from chapter 7 through chapter 12. Now, we, it, it outlines differently, but, but the center here, the two big events that take place that shape the action in 2 Samuel, first of all, God's covenant with David in uh, 2 Samuel, <coughs> excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 7, God's covenant with David that is gracious and unconditional, and then David's failure before God, his adultery with Bathsheba, and his uh, conspiring to have uh, Uzziah murdered by combat as he's placed on the front line so that he, he would, his life would be taken because David's got to cover up the fact that Bathsheba is pregnant by him and cover up his, his adultery. So that forms a significant center to the book, what happens in chapter 7, what happens in chapter 11, and in chapter 12. So as we come to this uh, section here. I want to stop and talk a little bit about the Davidic covenant. It is crucial to understand the Davidic covenant. It is the outgrowth of the second part of, of the Abrahamic covenant. God promised Abraham land. He promised him descendants, seed, and blessing. The land promise was expanded in the Palestinian or the real estate covenant, uh, back, it was called the Palestinian Covenant because when that terminology was developed, Palestinian meant Jewish, okay? And that's what it was until Arafat and the PLO co-opted the term in the mid-60s. But before the 60s, the term Palestinian was 
uh, was applied to the Jewish people and to Israel. There's the land promise, the seed promise, and then the blessing promise. Blessing promise is expanded in the new covenant. The seed promise is expanded in the Davidic covenant that's given in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16. Uh, Psalm 89 is a meditation or reflection by David on the Davidic covenant. And then 1 Chronicles 17, 11 to 14 is a parallel. Uh, 2 Samuel is written before the exile, much, much earlier, probably around 900 under Solomon. It's when it finally brought together. But 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles are written after the, uh, after the exile. And so their focal point is a little different, but 1 Chronicles 17, 11 to 14 is the parallel description of the Davidic covenant. In that covenant, there's a promise to David that he will be given an eternal house. Uh, this eternal house means an eternal dynasty. It doesn't mean that he will always have someone on the throne, but that his descendants will always reign. The legitimate throne of Israel goes to a descendant of David. That is why Jesus is a descendant of David. He's born to Mary, who's a descendant of David. Her lineage is traced in Luke 4, and he is born in Bethlehem, the city of David. David is promised an eternal kingdom in 2 Samuel 7, uh, 12c, and in 1 Chronicles 17, 14, and an eternal throne in 2 Samuel 7.13 and 1 Chronicles 17.12b and 14. Each of these, notice, are eternal. You can't have a finite human being fulfill an eternal promise. So that indicates, it implies that the one who will fulfill this is more than human. He is one who will be um, eternal. Uh, 2 Samuel, the covenant as it is described in 2 Samuel, emphasizes David's immediate seed, his physical seed, Solomon. And that is because there is a provision in there for discipline, divine discipline, if the covenant is, uh, is violated. That's in, uh, <clears throat> that's in 2 Samuel uh, 14. So it's focusing on Samuel and the possibility of sin. But since Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of the covenant, that does not apply to him because in his perfection there is, uh, there is no sin. The Davidic covenant is between God and David as the representative of his house, his family, uh, the ancestor to that family. And it emphasizes that seed aspect, the descendant from, from Abraham. There are uh, six provisions. Uh, the eternal house, which relates to the first block in 7, 11, and 16. Uh, it provides that David will be established, uh, Solomon rather, will be established on David's throne. That's in 2 Samuel 7, 12. He's the first in a line that culminates in someone who will uh, be on David's throne eternally. He also, Solomon that is, will also be given the privilege of building a temple. David is prohibited from building the temple because he's been a man of war. Uh, we are told also that the throne of Solomon's kingdom will be established forever because it will, his line will culminate in the line of one who will reign forever. Also that Solomon will come under divine discipline because of disobedience, which is what happened in uh, the Chronicles passage, the emphasis is on, is on the Messiah, and that discipline aspect is not uh, mentioned there. So he has promised an eternal house, an eternal kingdom, and an eternal throne. Next thing that we see, 4C at the bottom here, is that God expands David's kingdom in this section. This is uh, from Chap basically chapters 8, 9, and 10. Here we see David protecting the nation from the external enemies. And David, after he unifies the nation, after he defeats these enemies, you, you just go around the boundaries and he uh, provides security from the Moabites, the Ammonites. He defeats the Philistines and he defeats the 
uh, the Syrians, and so this provides uh, stability for uh, the United Kingdom. And then he begins to expand the United Kingdom further north into what we now refer to as Syria. So here is a map, and look at this map. This is uh, uh, notice this line here that goes far to the east. Here is Rabbah, that's modern Ammon, the capital of, of uh, Jordan. But the line here that is traced out, this is the uh, boundary of Solomon's kingdom. Although he doesn't control all of this land, the yellow up here indicates territory that is uh, under tribute to David and to Solomon, but they don't totally control it. It's not part of the kingdom. This blue line, if you can see it here right at the top, that's the Euphrates River, which runs down into Iraq off to the east. Israel is given all of the land from the Mediterranean to the Tigris, I mean to the Euphrates, all the way down. So all of this desert area, all of this was eventually to be part of their the promised land but they've never had all of it as part of israel but in the um in the early part of the 20th century when you have the british war council uh, signing the balfour declaration when balfour and lloyd george are asked later well what do you mean by the land that is israel's historic homeland and they said from dan which is up here in the north, right about here, south of Damascus, not, not 40 miles from Damascus, from Dan to Beersheba, down here in the, in the south. They looked at that. They, their frame of reference for Israel was always, always biblical. So this gives us a map and understanding of the expansion of the kingdom, the uh, purplish area here, bluish purple area, that is the territory that Saul controlled. So we see how much it expanded under David and Solomon. But then we come to chapter 11, and there's a great shift that takes place. And as we finish up with chapter 10, we see that, the, that David is fighting the, uh, in Ammon. He is fighting the Ammonites, but he is spending less and less time in battle. And as a result of that, he's home leaving the battle to Joab. And instead of being at the battle, he's home. And this, if he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, then he would not have seen Bathsheba bathing and had the whole temptation and then the adultery. All of that would have been avoided if he had simply been doing what he was supposed to be doing. His unfaithfulness to God is described in chapters 11 and 12. And this involves his sin of adultery, his sin then to cover up the fact that she's become pregnant. He has, enters into a conspiracy with Joab to put uh, Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, in the front line so that he'll be killed in combat. And then he seeks to cover it all up. Uh, Nathan, who's the prophet of God, will challenge David because in the Old Testament, the prophet, the word of God, the representative of God is always in authority over the king. And so Nathan comes in and tells a parable. And as a result of that parable, David says, well, the, um, the man, the, the um, uh, perpetrator there, and the parable should be to receive a fourfold punishment, and that is what becomes his punishment. The baby will be born, but then will become sick and die. Uh, one of his sons, Amnon, will uh, commit incest and rape his half sister, uh, Tamar. Then, in revenge, David's son, Absalom, will then kill. Amnon, and then eventually Absalom will lead a revolt against David. David will have to flee Jerusalem, flee for his life across the Jordan, and then at the end Absalom will be uh, killed by Joab. 
And David had a weak spot for Absalom. He spoiled him. He never held him to accountability. And after he learns of Absalom's death, he, he just screams out, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. He just had that blind spot to this rebellious uh, rebellious son. So all of that flows out of what happens in 11 and 12. So that is his great sin. Um, David is rejected by the people. They follow after Absalom. And so he leaves, and then eventually uh, the people recognize the evil of, of Absalom, and David will uh, return. So that's in chapters 13 through 20. Chapters 13 and 14 describe the events leading up to Absalom's rebellion. And we learn much about uh, Absalom. We learn in this time period that David's pretty wise. He knows because of God's covenant to him that he will return. And so he uh, when he first leaves, he goes down, he's crossing the Kidron Valley to come up on the Mount of Olives, and Abiathar and Zadok, who were the high priests, will be, are bringing the ark with them. He sends them back with the ark because he knows that he will return, that God is going to be faithful to Israel, and so he leaves them in Jerusalem to act as spies uh, for him. Also, we learn about Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, who has been crippled since he was a small child. And um, David has been very gracious to Mephibosheth, honoring that covenant that he had made with, uh, with his father, uh, Jonathan. But Mephibosheth has a slave named Ziva who tries to twist things, lie about his master uh, so that he can uh, be given all of his master's possessions. Eventually, uh, Ziba will get what is due him. And then we learn of another character named Shimei, who's a Benjamite who curses David. But David deals with him in grace. He deals with his enemies in grace again and again. We see the episodes where he leaves another close advisor behind, Hushai, to undercut the advice of Ahithophel. And Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. He'd been one of David's mighty men, very close uh, to David. And um, he turned against him. And as, they're, as they are working, and Hushai is working to get um, Absalom to reject Ahithophel's advice, God is working to do that and to uh, discount Ahithophel's advice in the, in the eyes of, of uh, uh, Absalom. And as a result, Ahithophel will be dishonored and he will commit uh, suicide. And it's not long after that before David returns to uh, Jerusalem. That, <clears throat> uh, that section going up to chapter 19 actually finishes up Absalom's uh, re rebellion and David's restoration to the throne. And then from chapters 21 to 24, we have these six different appendices that tell us something about what is going on in uh, different stages of David's reign. As I said earlier, these six appendices do not, uh, are not chronological. They are simply describing different events that took place during the time of David. The first is uh, David averts a famine as punishment for Saul's sin. What happens here is there's a famine in David's time for three years, and David seeks the Lord's counsel. Why are we going through this famine? And the Lord rep responds and says it's because D Saul broke a covenant that Joshua had made with the Gibeonites. And because he killed this, these Gibeonites, uh, we are, God is punishing Israel for, for, that, uh, for that failure. And so the Gibeonites come to David and they say, well, the only way in which we can have justice is for seven of Saul's descendants to be given to us and executed 
and then our honor will be restored. And so this is what happened. David pres preserves uh, and spares Mephibosheth, uh, the son of Jonathan. But there are seven descendants of of Saul then that are taken and they are hung simultaneously uh, in order to um, pay this this price and after that the famine ends and this is a time too when David takes their bodies takes their corpses goes to uh, Jabesh Gilead gets the bones of Saul and Jonathan and brings all of the dead of Saul's descendants back to uh, Gibeah and buries them together in the tomb of Kish. Then the second episode talks about the Philistine giants that, that and there's some disagreement that goes on here. For example, uh, there is the uh, mention of these four giants. In verse 16, Ishbinab, and in 17, Abishai, or no, excuse me, that Abishai kills him. Uh, and the second one is mentioned in verse 18, Sibachai the Hushathite kills Saph, who's one of the sons of the giant. Notice in verse 16, Ishbibinab is one of the sons of the giant. Chapter Verse 18, Saph is one of the sons of the giant. Verse 19, we have one of these odd textual problems in Samuel where it says that Elhanan, the son of Ja'ar or Agim, the Bethlehemite, killed the, and then your text may have brother of Goliath. That's written in italics because there's, there's a gap in the text. And some, some translation will just say killed Goliath the Gittite. Well, wait a minute, I thought David killed Goliath. And so there's a lot of discussion here. What we lost was probably not the phrase, the brother of Goliath, but the son of Goliath. The first two are sons of Goliath. And at the end of verse uh, 20, it talks about another guy that has uh, one of the sons of Goliath that has six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. And he also was born to the giant. And then in the conclusion... Verse 22 says, these four were born to the giant in Gath. So these four would all be Goliath's sons who were also giants, and they are all killed by different uh, individuals who are part of um, David's elite warrior corps, the um, mighty men. When we get to chapter 22, we've already covered most of it, or if not 98% of it, it is, uh, with a few differences, it is identical to Psalm 18. And so it is put here, not because it was written at this time, it was written at, by David at the time that he learned that Saul was, was dead. But it is put here as a summation of how faithful God was to David in giving him victory over all of his enemies. Those are the first three episodes in the, this appendix. In um, chapter 23, verses uh, 1 to 7, we see David's last words mentioned there, uh, and he praises God for making the everlasting covenant with him and how God is going to uh, bless him. And this is how... Uh, David speaks of, speaks of God here. And then there's a list of his mighty men starting in chapter 8 and describing all of these uh, different uh, mighty men that have been um, part of David's core. There are 37 who are mentioned here. And then we have the uh, last mention of this sin. Remember, this is not taken in order. Uh, David decides to number the people of Israel. There is a, a conflict, most people point out, between verse 1 of chapter, uh, chapter 24 and 1 Chronicles 21.1 says that it's Satan who moves David. Here it is God. Obviously, it is God who allows Satan to move David uh, to number the people and act where he's not trusting God. He's trusting in his own numbers. And the result of that is that God says, you, you can pick your discipline. 
And David picks a discipline of that will last very quickly in 24 hours, and then uh, it ends on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite in 24, 18 to 25, and it, the, the, the book ends with David building an altar on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite, which will be the site of the temple that Solomon will be allowed to build uh, and that occurs in 1 Kings. So that takes us through 2 Samuel. It is a focus on God's grace to David, who certainly is no more deserving of God's grace than anyone else. It emphasizes God's unmerited favor. The center point theologically and doctrinally is the Davidic covenant, which is fulfilled in the person of Christ. The promises of an eternal kingdom, an eternal throne, and an eternal seed are specifically said to be fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the greater son of David, who will sit upon David's throne. And so we see the faithfulness of God in fulfilling that covenant to David in the person of Jesus Christ. So that gives us our overview of 2 Samuel. And next time we'll come back and go to the beginning of David coming to the throne, reigning in Hebron, and what happens there with all of this civil war that takes place and why that is significant. Father, thank you for this time to study your word, to be reminded of your grace, your goodness, your faithfulness, to see how even someone as David, who is a man after your heart, is still succumbs to great sin, as we all do. We all have arrogance. We all are rebellious. Every one of us has a wicked heart, and yet you have forgiven us through Jesus Christ. You have provided a complete and sufficient payment for our sin, that none of us are, in, in one sense, any better or any worse than anyone else. We all uh, need your redemption, and we all need your grace. Even though some of the sins we commit have greater impact on others than other sins, nevertheless, when it, all sin is against you, and that sin that is against you is provided for and forgiveness is given, and all these episodes ultimately teach us of how to be kind and gracious to one another, uh, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. And we pray that you will help us to learn that lesson and exemplify this love in this congregation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.